Thank you for joining the final session of Frostro's Investment Seminar Series. My name is David Harris, and I'm part of the Frostro Capital Distribution Team. Next slide, please. Frostro now has 16 investment company clients, and we'll be joined by three of them on today's call. Next slide, please. The aim this afternoon is to provide a short, sharp update on each strategy before moving to a brief Q&A session after each presentation. We will look to address any unanswered questions post-event. We will first hear from the Premier Mighton team, who will present on Mighton Global Opportunities. We will then hear from Tim Levine, who will present on Augmentum Fintech. And finally, we will hear from Jeff Sue, who will present on the Biotech Growth Trust. As a reminder, you can ask questions at any time during the presentations using the Ask a Question button on the webcast page. Mighty Global Opportunities is a 100 million pound strategy that seeks to exploit inefficiencies in the investment trust sector. MIGO has performed strongly over the past six and 12 months and is among the best performing strategies in the flexible investment seminar uh, sector rather. With that, I will hand over to the team. Thank you very much for that introduction and welcome everyone to the Might and Global Opportunities presentation. Um, I know that there are many of you who probably know the trust, uh, you know, either pretty well or very well, um, but there will be some of you in the audience who um, if this might be the first time that you uh, heard myself and Nick speak. So um, for those of you that do know the trust very well, I apologise, but we will be, uh, you know, going back to the beginning and, and, and um, you know, really explaining what the trust does um, and, and how we find our investments. Uh, but we will uh, have plenty of time for questions at the end, and uh, Nick will be going over some stock specifics. Um, just so as, a, as a, an overview of the trust, what we look to do is uh, find value opportunities and deep discount uh, special situation opportunities in the investment trust world. Uh, because we can invest in anything as long as it's in a closed ended structure, that means that we have a global exposure, so everywhere from Vietnam to Berlin to the UK, and we have an ability to invest in uh, lots and lots of different kinds of asset classes. And we'll come on to this a bit uh, more later, but this creates incredible diversification as we can invest in everything from equities, to commodities, to property. And finally, the trust is just very different to lots uh, out there in the market. Uh, we're sort of a one-stop shop for people who either don't have the time or don't have the resources to be looking for these sort of special situation and discount opportunities. Uh, in the investment trust sector. Um, and so it is quite a, a diversifier um, for people's portfolio because we are just looking in a very different area of the market. So just to start off, this is sort of how we see the world and how we find our, um, how find our shortlist to go into the trust. Uh, so starting at the top of this funnel, is it trading at a discount? This is obviously the most important thing. This is what we're looking at. Um, for everything to go into the portfolio. And as you can see on the left-hand side, um, there are a, a list of things that sort of fall out the process at, at different, uh, different uh, uh, times. So large trusts, uh, they tend to be very well researched. They tend to be trading uh, around par. And we also think that our clients can probably take a view themselves whether, whether it's something they want to invest in. So we're really looking at the, at the sort of small and mid-cap area of the interest investment trust world. Uh, we have to like the asset class. Uh, the next slide will just sort of highlight why that's so important uh, to us. Um, so something like fixed income, which we've been a bit nervous of uh, over the past sort of little while, even though there are some fixed income for us trading on, on wider discounts, um, you know, that's not an area that, that, we, that we are investing in. Uh, do we have confidence in the NAV? So myself and Nick sort of spend day in, day out, really lifting the bonnet of these different investment trusts and trying to work out what we believe uh, the net asset value is. Um, and we really have to get comfortable with what, you know, what, how, how the uh, portfolio is valued and, and where we see it going forwards. Uh, myself and Nick have been through a few uh, investment cycles now, a few crashes. And uh, as a result, we sort of describe ourselves as being pretty allergic to leverage. We don't mind trusts using a bit of gearing, but anything that has structural leverage, uh, we would tend to, to steer clear of. And finally, there has to be a catalyst. This is very, very important. 
There are lots of trusts that are trading on wide discounts um, that will continue to trade on wide discounts for the next you know, three months, six months, year, two years, five years, because there is no catalyst to extract that value. So there has to be a reason why we believe um, that we can um, that that uh, that share price will will catch up with that now. So this is just really highlighting why it's so important for us to like the asset class. What we're looking for is for our investments to be sort of firing on both cylinders, two cylinders at once. So uh, the net asset value and the share price. Now you can see on the right hand uh, box in the top corner why um, and how that's um, you know so powerful for, as a combination for returns. Uh, when you've got that rising nav and that narrowing discount, uh, you really can be can be quite explosive, uh, explosive uh, in terms of return. Uh, something we had in the portfolio uh, until last year was uh, Ecofin Global Utilities. Uh, this fund had had a, had a bit of a poor run. Uh, they changed the management team. Management team turned around the portfolio, um, created some very good performance, uh, net asset value performance. And because of this, and because they'd managed to find some new investors and they'd um, upped their sort of marketing presence, uh, the discount also narrowed um, and we sold out of that uh, last year. One of the ways uh, that we extract the value is through realization. So this is the end of the trust itself, uh, whether that's by merger um, or sale or wind up. Something that we imagine will look a lot like this graph uh, is something called real estate investors, which is a Midlands property play. Uh, this trust has struggled in share price terms uh, because it had a large overhang in the market from one of its largest investors. That means the share price has been, has been pretty stuck despite some you know, pretty decent performance at the net asset value uh, level, despite you know, a lot of headwinds in the property sector um, due to COVID concerns. What we have more recently is the management team being quite vocal about the fact that this trust uh, is up for sale. You can see the, uh, the last report. Um, you know, this, they're, they're looking to, to sell this portfolio uh, sometime in the not too distant future. And you know, we're anticipating that once that comes to pass, um, the share price should be um, you know, much closer to that now when that, that, sale, uh, that sale happens. This is one of our favorite slides, and it really just highlights why people tend to hold the trust within their portfolios. And it's, it's, a, it's a real diversifier. What we've done is we put ourselves against A and B, which is the absolute return funds, and the mainstream indices, which is F and G, that's the FTSE World and the FTSE 100. And over the last five years, this stuff is over five years, over the last five years, um, absolute return funds have become quite popular just because investors are looking for something you know, different to put in their portfolio, something to diversify. However, as you can see, yes, you've had some very low volatility, but you've also had very little return um, over, these, over these five years from these portfolios. Um, in comparison with sort of F and G, which are the mainstream indices, you've had you know, some, some good performance from the FTSE world, less so from the FTSE 100, but with you know, much higher levels of volatility. And where we sit, we're with D and E, so D is the share price and E is the NAV. Uh, what you have here, we've, uh, our share price has, has comfortably uh, outperformed uh, the two mainstream indices, and but with uh, you know, volatility, which is it's, it's much further down the, the sort of left-hand um, side. And there's two reasons for this. Um, one is that when you invest in overlooked and unloved assets, um, you tend these trusts tend to uh, move on their own news flow rather than necessarily um, as volatile as volatile um, as, as sort of uh, uh, companies in, in mainstream indices. And secondly, we just have uh, you know incredible diversification, which we will come on to and talk about a bit more later. Two caveats, I would say. One is that we're not an absolute return fund. Uh, that's not what we do. And secondly, we don't try and sit down with a spreadsheet and manufacture these numbers. This is really just the natural outcome of, of how we of, of our investment style and our investment process. And just to put some, some numbers really uh, onto, uh, you know, the very low correlation uh, with the mainstream indices um, and just how it really does move to its own tune. It does move very, very differently. Uh, and now I'll pass it to Nick, who's going to talk more about the changes in the investment trust sector and some stock specifics. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, just on the uh, on, on the next slide here, the changing ownership of, of investment trust. I mean, you know, I've always been told I've been specialising in investment trust since 1995. That I must be mad. It's a dying industry. But um, 
you know, it keeps reinventing itself. I mean, when I first started, most of our shareholders would be institutions. More recently, it was wealth managers. And now, increasingly, the sector is owned by the self-directed investor. Um, you know, the periodicals that, are, that they read, you know, classically, Money Week, Investors Chronicle, Shares Magazine, et cetera, really get the point that closed-ended funds tend to outperform open-ended funds. Um, and however, the, the wealth managers are now so large, it's very difficult, the pots of money they run, it's very difficult for them to include investment trusts that you have to buy and sell them on the, on, on, on the stock market. That's not a problem for the, for the self-directed investor who might just want £25,000 worth of shares. That's very easy. It's just, it's just the, the click of a mouse. And, um, and, 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 the, and the trade is done. So the sector continues to, to reinvent itself. It continues to change. And just going on to the next slide, um, the most important change that we're seeing at the moment is, is the move to alternatives. Um, going back not that many years, investment trusts really were, the vast majority of investment trusts were, were equity funds. Uh, now the, the majority of funds are actually um, alternative asset classes. And, and this is because it's very difficult um, to operate with a, you know, an open-ended fund with an illiquid asset class. And we, we've seen the debacle in, um, in, in the property open-ended funds where you, know, you, you can't sell an office block within 24 hours to, to meet a redemption. And, and sometimes you end up with this fatal mismatch between the liquidity available to the fund manager and the daily liquidity they're offering to, to their investors. The most important reason why this is um, a great opportunity for the, for the trust going forward is that because of the history of investment trust being equity funds, um, the market still treats stated net asset values or the official valuations of the underlying portfolio that they produce as verbatim. Where of course, an alternative asset class, quite often the valuation process that either they get stale or the methodology has, 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 has not kept up with changes in that, that asset class. A couple of examples we have here, um, the trees, that's um, Fowler's Timber. Going back a couple of years, uh, the Chinese ban of selling a natural timber, which is fantastic news if you owned a lot of forests on the South Island of New Zealand, as, as Fowler's did. Um, yet the market didn't really react to that development. I mean, they were still looking at an official NAV of around 50 and the shares traded at, at, at around 40. Whereas in reality, that 50p valuation had become quite stale. There had been an enormous change and quite possibly the, the, the true nav was in the mid 60s. Um, but you are able to deal on, on yesterday's price. In the end of that particular example, price didn't move until there was a takeover bid from Australian hedge fund that had spotted this, this opportunity. But it's a classic case of where the, the, the state of the NAV is, 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 is stale and the market hasn't moved on. More topically, the, the other picture, um, flats in Berlin, you know, a lot of the investment trusts that have specialized in that area were set up in the mid 2000s as rental landlords but the valuation of the flat in Berlin because it's such a regulated market and in the rental market is vastly lower than the same flat would achieve if sold as, as, as into the private market and um, Phoenix Spree the, the trust that we currently own in, in that area has split around 70% of its portfolio and is selling some of these flats into the market at a much higher level than, than you know than the, the value in, in the NAV. So the discount there is much, much higher than the, uh, than, than the stated now. Just moving on to the next slide. Now, one of the attractions of MyGo is that it adds genuine diversification to people's portfolios. A lot of these asset classes, you just could not own in a, in a, in a, in a fund of open-ended funds. And it, this slide really gives you an insight into how varied the, the, the asset classes that we can choose from have become, and, and this list gets ever longer. The slide just shows what we currently own in, in MIGO, but there are vastly more opportunities out there that will be in the portfolio from, from, from time to time. And on to the next. Now, this is some of the names we have in the portfolio, and you can see here, um, the average discount of 16% really incorporates uh, um, a lot of much wider discounts, and a couple of situations that have come back into favour and um, have become quite mature and that, um, you know, we're feeding back into the market. Just looking at the, a couple of the successes, I mean, Baker Steel, we feel that, that the discount is actually much wider than the 0.6% than on that slide. What's happened in this particular trust is that, uh, you know, it, it uses its intellectual 
capital to get um, interesting mining prospects permitted up, and then then it will sell it on to a to a multinational. That's where the big uplifts come in the portfolio. Now, because of COVID, it's been difficult to do due diligence on, on mines. Um, a lot of the uh, specialist geologists in this area um, are Australian. Very difficult to get back into Australia, even if you've been um, down a mine in um, Zimbabwe. Um, and therefore, we think some of these big uplifts will actually happen this year. Uh, and also, um, a tungsten mine they have in Devon, of all places, looks like it's going to get floated. So, again, this is a situation there's a bit more to go. We are taking profits simply because it's run on so hard and it's become quite large in the portfolio. The other one there on that list, which is distorting the average, is River and Mercantile Microcap, very popular at the moment. This was one of our largest holdings and has been, you know, we've been steadily feeding into the market um, uh, to, to, to meet demand. Um, now, looking at um, some of the other ones, what's going to drive the, the NAV higher? Well, ones that are beginning to move quite nicely would include perhaps the point, a classic example of where, you know, we're always looking for, for, for a situation to be driven on two cylinders, the macro view or the top down move in the asset class, and also a, a special situation element. Uh, and in this particular case, the, the discount um, was extremely wide. We doubt, we're very bullish about the, the turnaround going on at that point, but we also doubt whether uh, um, the UK feeder will, will find a lot of interest. Um, you know, the disclosure requirements are, are quite onerous for, for, for a Wall Street hedge fund, you know, um, and that may lead to the thing being quietly wound down. Oakley Capital um, trades on an extremely wide discount, despite the fact that the, the portfolio has performed very, very well. We think one of the reasons is that the disclosure of fees, you know, um, with the, on, on the kid documents comes um, triggers a enormously high figure in Oakley's case of over seven percent, and therefore we think a lot of the wealth managers are selling despite the the, um, the progress being made in the portfolio, specifically. Um, a, a lot of the US private equity firms have, have notched up substantial gains in the first quarter of 2021. Yet Oakley Capital's NAV is still using the December figure. So we have all that to come in the in, in progress in, in the net asset value. And of course, that means the discount is, is, is much wider. Um, and finally, another one that that you know has got the potential to to um, to, to drive our NAV higher, EP special opportunities. Again, it's a fairly unusual private equity fund. Its portfolio has been completely distorted by the success of Luceco, which is now beginning to sell into the market. And therefore, you know, substantial discount and a lot of cash. And um, again, just looks to be at the, at the wrong price. So really, um, just to conclude um, what MyGo offers, you know, a low correlation, a lot of diversification, um, and actually, if you look at the um, the risk metrics, it um, you know it it, it, it it's, an, it's fairly unusual to be generating those kinds of returns with a very low level of volatility or very level of volatility that MIGO produces. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Charlotte. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Will Hampton Cook, I'm part of the distribution team. I can see we've got a number of questions which are to how if at all has the rotation from growth to value affected the portfolio's performance right we'll have to sort who's going to ask i'm going to nominate charlotte for this one yeah no problem um i mean what we've seen is yes you know some of a rotation from growth to value but importantly for the portfolio what we've seen is a broadening of the markets and um, sort of the worst market for the, for my global opportunities is what we saw in 2019 where you had just a very narrow focus on you know the sort of us high uh, growth tech stocks what we've seen um, more recently is investors being more interested in different areas of the market, whether that's UK microcap, whether that's 
as uh, commodities. Um, and this has meant that, um, you know, this is very important for um, for returns uh, for the portfolio because what we, uh, you know, what we're looking for are things coming in and out of favour. So when the market is very narrow uh, and, you know, only focusing on, on very high growth stocks, um, that, that's more of a difficult market, whereas we've now moved into a sort of a perfect, a perfect time for, for the portfolio to do very well. Thank you. And how has your view on the macro environment played out over the last 12 months? How has it changed more recently? Um, it's worked out pretty well, um, although it wasn't a particularly relaxing period at the time we were in, the, in the middle of it. But we, we, we took the view that the amount of stimulus, you know, monetary and fiscal help being pushed into the global financial system um, would still be sloshing around when the virus um, came to an end and everyone got back into the economy and that would create a bit of a sugar rush. So, you know, we we were buying at, at, at the low on that basis. I mean, you know, we assumed in fairness that the uh, the pandemic would be over in two or three months and and and, and clearly we got that wrong. But 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 going um long in that um in that situation has, has proved to be correct. I think you know we've run quite nicely for a, for about a year. I think the market now needs to pause while everyone works out what is going to happen? I mean, um, you know, we've been anticipating, or the market's anticipated that sugar rush and done quite well. Um, I think you know there, there is a pause at the moment while people try and work out what the world after the pandemic is actually going to be like. Thanks. How activist are you in terms of engagement and pushing to drive discount narrowing? I say it as one, Nick. Go for it. Yeah. Um, so what we would say is, you know, we're not ARBs, we're not sort of activist investors, um, but it is a tool in the box um, that we have in order to, to, to create discount narrowing. And um, what we like to say is that we, we like to do sort of, uh, um, you know, proactive and, uh, you know, our activism tends to be, you know, quite behind closed doors. We don't tend to be the kind of uh, team that is, is all over the newspapers. And, you know, it can be very positive activism rather than necessarily, uh, you know, pushing for board change, etc. It can be that um, we just help teams uh, navigate the sort of the investment trust world as, as running a trust is very, very different to an open-ended vehicle. Um, but yeah, it is a tool in the box and we have got involved uh, in several situations, um, some more recently, um, in order to, to get the best outcomes to the shareholders. I would just add to that, actually, just to give, we, we, you know, not everything stays behind closed doors as um, as we have been involved in one or two situations, but but the work we're doing at the moment, I mean, we, we've we've had um, discussion, shall we say, about a trust that perhaps was trading on a very wide discount that needed to be doing some some, some buybacks um, quietly behind closed doors. And another project we're working on at the moment is is getting um, trusts to um, update their um, kid documents because. We have this issue of OCFs and investment trusts looking very expensive. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of these. They're, they're, it, it's difficult sometimes to interpret what is a when you get away from equities and when you're getting into alternatives, which is where the trust world is now. You know, it is it is down to interpretation of sometimes what is part of the actual financial or the or the, or the investment function of the portfolio and what is a cost. Uh, and it could be very helpful for trusts to bring down some of these OCFs. Um, because that'll make them more viable, particularly the wealth managers and, and the fund of funds. So that's just a flavour of some of the things we're working on at the moment. Thank you. The, how accurate are the NAVs for various trusts in MIGO? And how do you determine the accuracy? Well, in, in the old days, most uh, investment trusts were equity funds, and that's quite straightforward. Um, you run your Bloomberg and it produces a NAV which you publish the uh, the following morning. The sector, as I, I touched on before, is quickly becoming a home for alternatives, and therefore um, the, the the NAVs can be quite subjective. Uh, you, they might have been just got stale because they might only issue a, a couple of NAVs a year. So you know, a lot of the work and our day job really is, is, is working out um, what the true value of the portfolio actually is. And, that, and that's not because the, the NAVs are inaccurate. Purely, you know, they could be stale. Uh, or, or the business model has changed, and the original methodology, um, um, you know, needs to be revised. Uh, and and sometimes people just aren't watching. So um, you know, that's a very big part of what we do day to day. 
which just wasn't a, um, a factor really five years ago. Maybe just following on from that, you've got some significant PE investment trust in the portfolio. Can you explain why? Yeah, well, it, I mean, that's yeah. actually quite a good following question from, from what we were just talking about. Um, you know, you've got two factors there. Um, you've got the fact that some of these uh, NASA values for private equity trusts can be quite stale. Um, when you had last year when trusts were, you know, marking to market some of their investments, um, and obviously they were hit quite badly in COVID, but you have this sort of lag on the way back up where you actually have some stale pricing uh, in their portfolios of, of companies that haven't, haven't been revalued up to up to current levels. And also just to pick up on what Nick was saying about the OCF charges, um, you know, wealth managers, et cetera, now need to um, uh, tell their clients the underlying charges for each of their funds. And as Nick was saying, some of these trusts, uh, it looks very, very high because they're using these kid documents, which aren't necessarily always accurate. And uh, think, uh, trusts like uh, private equity funds um, are, have been particularly hard hit uh, under this. So you've got some structural selling there uh, for sort of non-investment reasons, it's just because the charges look look much higher than they are in, in practice. Um, but actually, you've got you know a great tailwind in some of these uh, portfolios where uh, the methodology or the you know the pricing is quite stale in the underlying companies. Thank you. How has the pandemic affected the portfolio and what is your outlook for the future? Oh, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's quite a big question. I mean, I think it affected it in, in, um, how, in, in the earlier question when we were talking about the fact that we'd, um, we'd invested more further down the, um, um, you know, in, in, in the middle of the, of, of, of the crisis. Um, so I think that um, the big change was a more aggressive on the on on on, on the bullish side. Um, I think that 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 period is 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 we're sort of moving on to the cusp of a of, of, of a new period. Um, yeah, I think yeah, it, it, it's been as I said, I think we probably pretty well answered that in the uh, in in the earlier question really because it's that has been the the main driving force of the direction markets over the last fifteen months. Thank you. How has market liquidity fared over the last few years, and particularly through the pandemic? Has MIGO coped with this? Um, I think because my well, because MIGO is a closed ended uh, vehicle, because we're an investment trust. Um, you know, if the problems with liquidity, we uh, you know because we can sit there and pick up stock and let stock go when we think it's the right time to buy and sell. It does mean that we are very fortunate um, that we don't have the same sort of liquidity issues that you would do uh, in an open-ended where, you know, you have to find, um, you know, uh, you have to be able to sell your investments at a moment's notice to meet redemption. So the fact that MIGO is a closed-ended fund and, and we, that's how we invest in these things is, is, is very useful. Um, we found in the pandemic that um, there was certainly, um, you know, a lack of liquidity. Uh, we saw, you know, wholesalers of trust sort of slashing prices to make um, them pretty, to make trust pretty unpalatable to sellers. Um, as Nick said, you know, we took the view that this was a, a period we wanted to go long. Uh, we wanted to, you know, uh, sort of slightly gear the portfolio and add to our holdings at, at very depressed prices. So we were very happy to sort of pick up stock, um, uh, you know, every day, just small amounts and small amounts and add them to the stockpile, which is, you know, is, is what's kind of helped drive returns uh, since, since uh, the pandemic low. Thank you. Um, this one looks to be in relation to one of the slides in the presentation. Could you elaborate on the performance and volatility of the trust? Over the last five, three, and one years. Um, yes. Well, um, I think you've seen. I think the slide that you're um, you're referring to. I mean, it, clearly the MIGO tends to have a relatively low volatility, um, and that's because a lot of the, the the things that we invest in have fallen below the radar. Nobody cares about them, and they very much dance to their own tunes. So they tend to move when there's some news on on, on on that trust rather than being marked up and down with the markets. Which which would you know mean that they they um, exhibit very low volatility, and you'd expect that. And you're going through the, the, the period last year, I mean, a lot of um, a lot of trusts were buying at seventy pence in the pound. You know, situations where we can see a catalyst for change. Um, 
clearly, you know, that will, um, you know, that that will um, demonstrate pretty low volatility as well. So, uh, yeah, to, to sum up that slide, I mean, you, you would expect MIGO um, to be, you know, demonstrate quite low volatility. And as you can see from the numbers over, over recent years, as we spot things coming in and coming out of favour, um, that's been absolutely ideal for generating some decent performance. We've expended all the questions. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you both, Nick and Charlotte, and we're now going to move on to our second presentation of the afternoon, which will be from Augmentum Fintech. Launched in 2018, Augmentum invests in a focused portfolio of fast-growing and transformative private fintech businesses in the UK and wider Europe. We will now hear from the portfolio manager, Tim Levine. Good afternoon and thank you for joining me and thanks to the Frostro team for inviting me to the webinar. My name is Tim Levine, I'm the CEO of Augmentum Fintech and over the next uh, 20 minutes or so I wanted to give you a bit of a whistle-stop tour um, in terms of uh, Fintech as an opportunity, as an industry, uh, the evolution over the past 12 months and our approach in Augmentum and how we're offering uh, investors, uh, diversified exposure to this uh, emerging uh, asset class. Now, um, nothing like a quote uh, from one of the incumbent CEOs, one of the best known incumbent CEOs and Jamie Dimon in terms of how he sees uh, both the threat, but also the opportunity uh, of fintech. And I think he is not alone in really kind of opening uh, his eyes uh, and JP Morgan's eyes to, uh, you know, what is ahead. We are going through uh, an extraordinary uh, evolution. Some might argue revolution, but I think we're kind of beyond that point. And, you know, that has been driven over the past 12 months by uh, a really significant uh, movement in customer behavior, um, both uh, consumers, but also businesses as well, um, who have had real kind of accelerated adoption uh, in financial services, digital financial services, uh, whether it's kind of the downloading uh, of apps for the first time, or it's kind of the significant number of consumers across kind of Europe and globally who are using far less cash than ever before. And I think when we look at the, the size of the opportunity and we're tackling a 14, 15 trillion dollar kind of global opportunity, um, although we are fishing in arguably the deepest pool in terms of potential, in terms of kind of penetration, this is a, an industry that has been slow to disrupt. And there's a lot of complexity, there's a lot of regulatory challenges uh, in the industry. But ultimately, although we are still, you know, 10% uh, or a little bit above uh, penetrated, there is still a long way to go. But at the same time, the businesses that are being built are becoming much more material part of the overall uh, financial services landscape. Uh, and I think few are now saying uh, that this is an industry that still has much to prove itself. The question is not, you know, if it's how big an opportunity is this going to become over the next uh, five to 10 years. And, you know, where we are today, we're talking about, you know, over 650 billion so far of investment that's gone in. That steadily increased kind of COVID year not, uh, notwithstanding. Um, and it's now kind of really kind of permeating a number of different kind of uh, verticals and subsectors within financial services. Yes, kind of payments has been very much kind of the leader and, you know, a large part of that capital has gone into disrupting and we're seeing some very significant businesses that both are being built and uh, continue to be built, whether it's the likes of kind of PayPal, uh, all the more kind of, you know, uh, relevant ones today, whether it's Stripe, whether it's Agin, these are huge uh, you know, decacorn or multi-decacorn businesses that are that are being built. And I think that really has kind of highlighted the opportunity to institutional investors who have seen uh, the size of the uh, of the businesses that, that are being built and are looking increasingly now for exposure, not just in digital payments, but beyond as, uh, as well. And, you know, how has that translated in the kind of first quarter of this year? Um, you know, for us, the light bulb moment was several years ago. I think for many institutional investors in particular, that moment to, has come over the previous kind of 12 months. They've seen the opportunity. They've seen that accelerated digital adoption. 
Uh, and I think if you look at kind of Q1 of 20, uh, 2021, uh, you will have seen, you know, as much investment in the first quarter as there was in the whole of 2016 uh, and 17 as well. And if we carry on on that trajectory, then we're going to see, uh, you know, a two to three X uh, relative to kind of any any previous year. So um, the you know the opportunity is is clearly very much there, but the large institutional investment community on a global level has really kind of recognized that now is a start, time to start deploying uh, you know significant capital and you know we're experiencing that this is not just a kind of a, a us phenomenon or a you know an asian phenomenon you know europe is very much at the heart uh, of the you know fintech revolution um, we're seeing similar growth here than we're seeing on a global level and that you know as importantly uh, in the uk uh, you know, we are at the center of kind of European gravity when it comes to fintech. So, you know, over 50p in every pound of fintech investment in Europe uh, is out of the UK. Not to say that there isn't kind of significant opportunity kind of beyond the UK, but ultimately, you know, we are a uh, European focus fund. Uh, you know, our center of gravity is here in the UK, but ultimately, increasingly, we are looking at opportunities, uh, you know, beyond the UK. Um, as as well as continuing to kind of explore, uh, you know, what we're seeing here in the UK in terms of kind of, you know, evolution and innovation, uh, which continues to kind of move at, at real pace. Um, and I guess in a market that is seeing, you know, more capital than ever before, you know, one of the question is, you know, how do you differentiate yourselves? Um, and how can you kind of stay relevant, uh, you know, in a market that in some respects, some might feel is overheated. And I, I kind of hit that last point first. I think for you know the previous few years, we felt this was a huge sector that required significant capital. And as an ecosystem, we really felt undercapitalized. I think you know, seeing these very large institutional global investors come in, become attracted uh, to the asset class will allow us to really uh, fulfill the potential of a lot of our, uh, our, of our businesses that we're, we're trying to grow. And I think for ourselves as a fund, um, you know, what we bring to the table is that real kind of operational and entrepreneurial DNA. We've been in and around the European venture ecosystem as, uh, as entrepreneurs or, or investors uh, over the past uh, 20 years. And that really kind of differentiates us from uh, many um, European VCs who are either generalists in nature and also, uh, you know, don't quite have you know the same amount of uh, entrepreneurial, uh, operational uh, DNA to have kind of built and scaled uh, you know very successful uh, European digital uh, businesses. And as an asset class, I think it's hard to argue against that if you haven't had exposure to uh, venture capital over the recent years. Uh, then you have missed uh, some, you know, significant return opportunities. Um, and there's no question if you look at the top two quartiles uh, of, you know, venture returns over the past, you know, five, 10 or even 20 years, they have outperformed the public markets uh, across all those periods. And then once you dig into venture and you really look at, you know, for those that do specialize or for those kind of, you know, within a generalist fund, what has been the driver of those returns? it's fair to say that fintech as an asset class has been an outperformer. Um, and I think for us to specialize in financial services in fintech really stands us in, in good stead. Uh, and ultimately, uh, you know, we believe those returns will continue to uh, persist as a significant opportunity over the next five to 10 years. Uh, you know, hopefully we'll have, you know, similar results to, uh, to share. And there's no question that you know, one of the challenges that public markets uh, investors have uh, and have had in recent years is how they tackle this dynamic of companies staying private for longer. There is more capital than ever before at the later stage. And I think entrepreneurs, founders, CEOs have a choice now, which they didn't necessarily have in as plentiful uh, terms several years ago, where at those growth stages, if early investors are looking for an exit or a, a partial exit, or you're looking for an outsized growth round, there is very significant growth capital available to these uh, to these companies. And you know the question that you know a founder 
or CEO needs to answer is, do you want to wait another one or two years, focus solely on executing the strategy, stay private, uh, and not have the distraction of the public markets? Or do you want to kind of take, off, take that on at this stage? And I think a lot of uh, you know, entrepreneurs are looking at the capital available and taking that choice that they will stay private for that, that little bit longer, um, which can very much be in the interests uh, of the company. Uh, the question is, it's not necessarily in the interest of, of the public market investor that wants to get exposure to some of these businesses that are growing to very significant sizes. And I think for us, one of the motivations and catalysts for building Augmentum uh, as an investment trust was to give that diversified exposure to investors to allow them to get access to private market, high quality, high growth fintech companies um, at an earlier stage and allow them to kind of ride uh, on that journey and hopefully deliver them uh, some of the re those returns along the way, um, you know, until these businesses in some cases uh, become public. But the reality is, in our view, that the vast majority of these businesses will not make it to the public markets. And I think that's a challenge for, for an investor that is looking for that diversified exposure. Um, and quickly kind of really giving you a uh, kind of headline in terms of Augmentum, where are we on our journey? We're three years old. We just put out our full year results uh, in the last couple of days. Uh, we're just under 200 million pounds in, uh, in NAV. Uh, and a measure that we, we look at quite closely in terms of how are we progressing. Our internal target as an investment team is to deliver a 20% RR to investors uh, over, the, you know, over the term. Uh, uh, of, um, I would say, of our fund, but you know, ultimately, uh, for as long as we're able to uh, to keep doing this, um, and you know, currently we're on a run rate of 19% of our uh, invested capital, and so we're on track, recognizing that there is still a lot to do, uh, but the portfolio uh, is, you know, is evolving. I think what we really tried to do three years ago was to say we would like three years to build out a diversified portfolio by raising an initial pool of capital and then having further issuances along the way. Once we've demonstrated, uh, you know, one, uh, that we can execute on the, uh, uh, on the articulated strategy and two, start to show the progress of some of these um, companies that require that further, um, you know, further growth rounds where we can continue to support these companies along the way and maintain our position and also capitalize on evolving trends uh, in the fintech ecosystem as well. Uh, and I think we've done that. I think we've been uh, effective in how we've deployed. Uh, currently, we sit at 82% in deployment. We've got a number of uh, opportunities in the pipeline. So uh, when we talk to investors uh, towards the end of last year about when do we expect post our um, placement in uh, late October of 2020, we said by end of uh, June of, uh, of 2021, we would expect to be substantially uh, fully deployed. And I think we've, um, you know, we are, we are very much on track to, uh, to do that. And you know, how has that kind of evolved? And I think we've you know, gone about building a portfolio that is um, you know, diversified across a number of the subsectors uh, within financial services. And I think different sectors um, have been disrupting at, at different kind of rates of, uh, of speed as well. Um, so there are areas where we don't currently have as much, much exposure, despite the fact that we still think there's significant opportunity ahead. So, uh, you know, the world of InsureTech, uh, we still believe that there is a long, uh, you know, there's a long way to go in terms of uh, that disruption. But as of yet, we don't have any you know, meaningful exposure in that space. Our focus has been on building, uh, you know, real exposure into the you know, SME financial stack to look at kind of the infrastructure, the rails, the picks and shovels uh, that are underpinning not just kind of fintech businesses, but also solve helping solve the problems of financial uh, services incumbents as well who are struggling uh, with uh, digitization and are working collaboratively now, which has been a real shift in particular in the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, with you know innovative tech-led uh, fintechs that can help provide solutions uh, to some of the technical challenges uh, that they've uh, had as well. And when we think about what does that mean in terms of uh, the stages of maturity that the portfolio uh, has deployed its capital in, I think you know we have very deliberately constructed the portfolio that you have uh, businesses towards the later stage. 
uh, of their evolution, uh, where they have proven out their business case. The product market fit is very much there. Yes, they're still growing, but they're on a path to profitability, if not already profitable, um, and very much you know, have a visibility of exit over the next 12 to 24 months. And I think that's incredibly important that this isn't just full of high potential, high risk uh, binary outcomes. Uh, you know, series A businesses, that, which is what we would define an early stage business with revenues, but not yet kind of really proven itself out at scale. We have a number of very exciting high potential businesses, uh, but with that um, clearly comes some risk. And so, you know, the portfolio, the weight of the NAV is towards the, uh, you know, the growth and the, and the later stage, but the weight in terms of number of companies is, is towards the earlier stage. And I think when we are seeing those positive uh, signs when we see those key metrics and KPIs that we're comfortable with, uh, then that's an opportunity for us to really kind of double down and continue to invest and support those uh, those businesses on their uh, on their journey. And you know, this has been really the first opportunity for us uh, in, in recent days to kind of have a full uh, look at the portfolio, how it's traded over that kind of first twelve months of a of a COVID environment, and. Uh, you know, as I had alluded to earlier, you see a portfolio that has been, you know, a net beneficiary of the accelerated adoption uh, in digital financial services, businesses that are really growing. Um, and not just kind of our early stage businesses, so whether it's the likes of Fairwill that is disrupting uh, digital desk services and, uh, you know, the likes of Wills and Probate, um, you know, or the, uh, you know, all the likes of Cushion, which is a recent investment for us, uh, which is, you know, exploring the, uh, the workplace uh, pensions digitization, but it's also some more established businesses, you know, the likes of Bullion Vault, the likes of Interactive Investor that have seen, you know, record revenue numbers, you know, record customer growth, uh, record assets under administration, uh, record daily average uh, uh, trades as well. Um, and then perhaps some businesses that many of you might not have heard of, uh, more B2B, but the likes of Onfido, that is blazing a trail in compliance, KYC onboarding, really the engine in uh, helping uh, innovative fintechs, but not only that, financial traditional financial services companies as well, onboard new customers in a seamless way, but ensuring that the compliance and KYC onboarding has, uh, has been done uh, you know, to the, to the right level. Uh, and that's a business that's not just growing here in Europe, but, you know, also uh, in the US as well. And, you know, for us over the past 12 months, it's also been a question of working with those businesses that have had challenges. And, you know, some of our more significant uh, positions uh, in, uh, in Iwaka and Zopa, two businesses um, that have really kind of, you know, stepped away in March, took a hard look at the kind of uh, economy and said, okay, what do we do uh, in a in an environment such as such as COVID? And I think both businesses had to ensure they're well capitalized, which they were. I think Iwaka is a great example of a business that can adapt, it can move very quickly. Uh, it shows the benefit of a tech-led business. Uh, it became one of the first non-bank lenders to be accredited uh, for C-bills. It issued over 350 million uh, in loans and C-bills because its core product was ironically usurped by government stimulus and the bounce back loan. But I think both of those businesses and Zopa in particular have come out of uh, the you know, COVID environment in a much stronger position. Uh, Zopa, which has transitioned from marketplace lender to uh, fully fledged bank, has seen fantastic growth in its credit card launch uh, through its auto loan uh, proposition, as well as its kind of long term underlying um, uh, lending business as well. So we think they're on a really uh, positive trajectory uh, going forward. Um, and just really kind of wrapping up the uh, the whistle stop tour, it's really important to highlight as an investment team, we're very thesis driven. So we look at, you know, one, the areas of focus that we've historically targeted, but then also look at the portfolio, uh, look at the market dynamics, look at where we're, you know, underweight or look at where the, uh, the market is evolving and saying, how can we get exposure in these areas? And I think about a year ago, we looked hard at the portfolio construction and felt that there was uh, you know, more exposure required in the world of payments, uh, the evolving industry of, of DeFi, decentralized finance, and then this kind of really underplayed area uh, of pensions where we've seen, uh, you know, more venture capital that has been deployed into uh, more business to consumer propositions, but not so much in the B2B2C area. And we see kind of auto enrollment, workplace pensions, 
uh, you know, savings propositions in France as real opportunities. And I think our investments in Epsom and Cushion really kind of highlight that, uh, you know, we map out that market and then really look for exceptional opportunities, uh, some of which might not always be obvious. And we're prepared to be contrarian uh, at times when we, when we need to be. And that really kind of leads us into, uh, you know, what we think is a, a compelling pipeline. We're always going to have that healthy tension uh, in the pipeline where we have a multiple of opportunities relative to the capital available to us. But it does give us a really good opportunity for, um, for scale. Uh, these are relationships that we've nurtured, not just over the previous two or three years, but over the previous 20 years as well. And we're continuing to kind of map out uh, each of the subsectors, continue to kind of uh, leverage those relationships, both with the founders, but also with the angel investors, uh, seed funds, kind of fellow kind of VC investors as well and then really kind of execute and execute quickly when we see a compelling opportunity. And I think that is certainly something which uh, uh, from our point of view is, you know, a competitive advantage where we do feel we can, uh, you know, we can capitalize on that kind of deep uh, thesis that we've developed. And, uh, and when we do have that conviction, then we are, you know, uh, able to kind of move uh, very quickly. And, and just finally, just in terms of how that does, uh, tie together those opportunities uh, that we're immediately looking at. I think one of the areas that we've really focused on over the past 12 months is to really kind of get that diversification uh, across uh, Europe as well. Yes, as I said earlier, the UK is the center of gravity, but increasingly really interesting and compelling opportunities in Germany and France. And of course, some pockets of excellence, whether it's you know the likes of you know, Netherlands or Scandinavia uh, or even Estonia that have all built you know, very significant multi-billion dollar fintech, but had to kind of expand that business in Europe first and then uh, beyond Europe as, uh, as well. So I will uh, pause there. Thank you for uh, taking the time to listen uh, and look forward to uh, answering any questions that you, uh, you may have. Well, thanks, Tim, for that presentation. Uh, we're now going to move to some, some questions from the floor. Uh, the first of which is, who do you see as your peers or who do you see as your peers in the fintech market and how are you different? Um, Thank you, David, and uh, good afternoon to all those who are listening. I mean, I think what stands us out, certainly in the listed markets, is we are the only publicly listed fintech fund that is uh, targeting private fintech assets. So um, I think we are particularly differentiated there. I think in terms of who we come up against on a day-to-day -day basis, it would be kind of more uh, I guess, traditional GPLP venture capital funds. But I would say most VCs are generalist funds um, rather than specialists. And I think in a market where capital um, is at a greater level of depth than ever before, differentiation is incredibly important. So I think that specialism and that unique structure really does hold us in good stead to get you know one exposure to some of the very best opportunities but to the ability to kind of convert and execute on those as well. No, thank you. And as the, the sector matures, are you seeing the rate of new ideas that a new companies increase, accelerate? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say we're in a market that is as um, buoyant in terms of capital available, in terms of uh, depth of um, opportunities as we've seen uh, for many a year. Uh, I certainly think if you look at the inflow in the first quarter of this year and the early numbers from the second quarter that are coming through, you're seeing record funding levels in fintech, not just uh, in Europe, but globally as well. Um, and so I think there's, you know, there, there's two ways to look at that. I think, you know, when we listed the uh, the fund three years ago, you know, our question to the, to the broader market that we were undercapitalized as a ecosystem. And I think now we are... Uh, building a capital base that is really going to allow these fintech businesses in Europe and in the UK in particular to fulfill their potential. So we're seeing more capital than ever before come from North America, from Asia, uh, from a combination of growth funds, you know, sovereign wealth, you know, large hedge, fund, hunt, hedge funds who all, I think, recognize the very significant macro opportunity of that fintech presents. And I think in some cases have been uh, you know, somewhat sitting on their hands in previous years, uh, somewhat regrettably, and I think are now looking to build exposure. So I think it's a great opportunity and moment for the sector. 
Um, but at the same time, uh, that can create valuation inflation in parts, and we just need to kind of remain disciplined and focus, you know, uh, on the areas which we think hold the most potential. Um, and then at times, you know, prepared to be contrarian as well, which we're certainly not afraid to uh, be at the right uh, opportunity. That's a nice segue into the next question, which is, can you please take us through the processes and decisions made on whether to add or to sell an investment that has not gone to plan? Um, so, I mean, I think for, for us, we are a fund that has to be prepared to take risks. We are investing not at the very early stage, not at the seed or pre-seed typically, I and mean, usually at Series A and beyond. So there is product market fit for the proposition. But ultimately, you know, we are looking to deliver, you know, returns to investors of, you know, an RR of 20% over the long term. So we have to be prepared to take risk. And with that comes, you know, inevitable challenges where not all of your uh, investments are going to succeed. Um, and uh, I think if we don't have investments that, uh, that fail, then we're probably not taking enough risk along the way. I think, you know, the key, you know, the key kind of behavioral challenge that we have as a fund is to not throw good money after bad. And, you know, there will be investments that we make where we dip our toe in, put a small check in. Uh, we can be very, you know, convinced with a thesis. Uh, we can believe that there's a large market opportunity for that, you know, business to attack. We can be, you know, convinced that this is a management team that can execute. But ultimately, if after, you know, uh, a window of time where we think they've been given enough uh, opportunity and enough capital to really prove it out, and it's not showing the right signs, then we're going to have to step away. And I think that's really, uh, you know, part of the challenge as much as backing your winners all the way, which really in the rule of venture uh, is to ensure you do, do that and that will maximise your return. It's also not to, uh, you know, throw money uh, into propositions that, you know, you might have been emotionally attached to, but ultimately aren't delivering the, uh, the expected performance. And I think, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's to be expected. Um, and, you know, certainly I think for us as a, as a fund, we're very conscious of that and, you know, actively look to address that, uh, you know, on a, on a quarterly basis when we really do dig into the portfolio and also as and when the, these funding opportunities uh, appear uh, as well. We have to kind of look, even when a business is performing exceptionally well, it still has to go through our, our investment committee uh, with an investment paper to determine whether we should be following uh, any further funding in that uh, in that particular business. No, great stuff. Uh, why did you elect to use an investment structure for the vehicle? Um, well, I guess, yes. I mean, it's certainly for venture capital, uh, listing a venture capital fund and certainly as an investment trust uh, was uh, unusual. And as I said earlier, we're, we are somewhat atypical uh, as, a, as a fintech investor in terms of our structure. But I think we were compelled by a number of reasons. One, the idea of having uh, that kind of permanent capital that allows you to be patient when you need to be, but also realize an exit when it's in the best interest. Uh, and you can kind of recycle uh, those returns and, and arguably partially return some of those to, to investors. I think that really aligns your incentives with your investors. I think you see a lot of dynamics in traditional venture capital funds, kind of GPLP structures, where there's an incentive to invest the fund so you can raise the next fund. You then have conflict between the two funds if a proposition uh, or business is taking longer and you can't invest out of this fund, but you need to invest out of the other fund. I think there's a lot of kind of behavioral uh, traits that certainly kind of comp can compromise the manager. I think the other thing is differentiation. I talked a little bit earlier about the um, the market, uh, you know, being more competitive, there's more depth. Uh, and I think um, entrepreneurs are looking for differentiation. And I think our structure appeals to some. Um, and also providing that diversified exposure to both you know, retail and institutional investors who, frankly, are finding it very difficult to get diversified exposure to fintech in the public markets. Companies are, um, by their nature of, uh, of kind of the debt for capital in the private markets, staying private for much longer. And I think if you look at these outlier success stories in fintech, when you, when you look at Stripe at 95 billion or Klarna at 40 odd billion, uh, you know, even Revolut at 9 billion, these are all businesses that are still private. And I think if and when they go public, and I think TransferWise or Wise, as it's now known, is mooted to be going public in the coming weeks uh, at around between 5 and 9 billion, 
Um, you know, that public market investor has missed the run all the way up. Uh, and I think for us to offer um, uh, a vehicle where we can provide that diversified exposure at a much earlier stage where, uh, you know, traditional public market investors can benefit across a diversified portfolio, uh, I think is really exciting. And I think it's innovative. And I think if I look at our share register, uh, we have an incredibly varied list of uh, retail investors, wealth managers, uh, pension funds, family offices, and I think all of whom uh, are fundamentally kind of you know, believing in the long-term opportunity in fintech uh, and love the idea of having that diversified exposure through us and love to see others doing doing what we're doing as well, because I think you know, the market is significantly deep uh, and uh, yeah, I think there's a lot more opportunity to be developed over the coming years. No, well, you've convinced me, Tim, anyway, on that front. Um, what areas of the market most excite you currently? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I think we're very thesis driven as a fund. And, you know, there are a number of areas that over the past few years, you know, we're excited about their long term potential. I think our challenge is not just about being right, it's about being right at the right time. Uh, and some of these kind of sectors within financial services can just take a little bit longer, whether it's insurance, uh, whether it's asset wealth management, whether it's pensions, uh, they're all kind of evolving and disrupting at different, uh, different pace. Um, I think the pandemic has fundamentally accelerated digital adoption in financial services by three or four years. There's no question that we are. We've seen a huge unlocking of quite stubborn demographics that have shifted online and are staying online as they see the benefits of, uh, uh, of transacting uh, with financial services through, you know, through apps or other means. And so, you know, for us, that's really kind of allowed us to uh, accelerate our approach, whether it's uh, in workplace savings uh, and uh, and pensions, and we just backed a big business called Cushion and Napsor in France, and then kind of very uh, what I would regard as you know binary outcomes, uh, decentralized finance or DeFi as it's now known. You know that is a massive massive opportunity, riddled with execution risk and riddled with uncertainty. But if decentralized finance does become an integral part of our a global financial system, then you know we are at the start of a journey where you know enormous financial businesses are going to be built outside of the existing infrastructure. And I think it's for us as a as a team to be ahead of the curve there. Uh, you know, we spent a large part of the last 12 months really looking at DeFi. Uh, you know, made a uh, small investment uh, in Parify Capital that really kind of opens up our access to a really exciting uh, and emerging asset class. And then the other, you know, the, the, the other thing to say is to look at sectors where we don't necessarily have exposure, where we feel we're underweight. Uh, and I think, um, you know, payments is one area where, you know, I would like, with the benefit of hindsight, to have more exposure. Um, but I still think there's a lot of innovation there, and I think open banking is creating a whole new raft of opportunities. We're back to business called Vault, uh, which is in the open banking uh, payment orchestration space, and I think there's, you know, a lot of opportunity there. So. Uh, you know, I think ultimately our job is to, you know, remain strong to our thesis, adapt to the market conditions, um, you know, do the hard yards uh, in the background, continue to kind of build out our, our pipeline and our watch list, leverage the huge number of relationships that we've had, um, and then really double down as and when we see the opportunity and it's uh, ready for us to execute on. Uh, and that's really important. Uh, executing at speed in this market when you have that conviction is extraordinarily important. And I think that's something which we're very conscious of uh, and adapting accordingly. Thank you. We've got time for one more question now. Uh, why is the UK so ahead of wider Europe on the fintech scene? Um, well, I think we've been building our fintech ecosystem for quite a long time. I, I think both successive governments uh, have been very supportive. Um, and also you need a... Uh, an infrastructure where you have a central bank, uh, where you have, you know, governmental support, where you have regulatory support. And I think if you can get that triumvirate of uh, parties all working collaboratively alongside an industry uh, which has the DNA and IP to innovate, and I think, you know, the UK and London as a financial services hub for the last hundred years has given us that, you know, unfair advantage. Um, and so I think, you know, we find ourselves now in 2021 where 50 to 60p uh, in every pound of fintech investment in Europe comes out of the UK. 
Um, but we're in a growing market. And I think, you know, for ourselves, you know, we're a pan-European fund, although the center of gravity is very much here in the UK. We've invested in France, we've invested in Germany and Switzerland, and increasingly, I would say about half of our deal flow is uh, is now kind of outside of, of the UK. So I think, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of opportunity ahead. I think we've got a very strong uh, position to build on. We can't be complacent, but initiatives such as um, the Khalifa review also really help us to kind of further the industry's kind of progress and hopefully will allow us to kind of stay ahead um, of the rest of Europe. But I guess, you know, for us, our job is to find you know, the very best opportunities, whether they're in the UK or beyond. So, uh, you know, we'd love to see continued growth in the sector. And just to give you a final kind of stat, uh, you know, the first half of the year, we've seen twice as much capital in fintech in Europe than we saw in the whole of 2016 and 17 combined. So that kind of gives you a sense of the momentum uh, and scale of the industry um, is uh, is moving out. No, thanks, Tim. Really interesting. Uh, appreciate your time and the presentation today. Thank you, David. We will now uh, move to our third and final presentation. Uh, this one will be from Jeff Soon, who is the portfolio manager of the Biotech Growth Trust. Uh, for those that you that don't know, Biotech Growth Trust invests in the worldwide biotechnology industry and performed very strongly through 2020, posting share price gains of 67.7%. This represented 45.6% outperformance versus its benchmark, the NASDAQ Biotechnology Index. We will now hand over to Jeff Sue of All Women Advisors. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jeff Shu. I'm a general partner at Orbimed and the portfolio manager for the Biotech Growth Trust. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my presentation today. For those of you who are not familiar with Orbimed, Orbimed is a healthcare dedicated investment management firm. We have been investing solely in healthcare across subsectors for over 25 years. We have a global footprint with offices in New York, San Francisco, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Mumbai and Herzliya, Israel. We have about $20 billion of assets under management with over 100 investment professionals worldwide. Specifically with regards to the Biotech Growth Trust, uh, the relevant investment professionals for this particular fund are shown on this page. At the top of the page is myself. I've been the portfolio manager of the Biotech Growth Trust continuously since 2005. And listed below me are a number of very talented research analysts who are dedicated to covering the biotechnology sector. You will notice that uh, many of them have either an MD or a PhD degree. We think technical scientific expertise is critical to investing successfully in this sector. And at the very bottom of this page, you'll actually note four individuals who comprise our emerging markets research team. These individuals actually work out of our Shanghai and Hong Kong offices and actually are responsible for sourcing opportunities in Chinese biotech. And I'll uh, get into that a little bit later uh, in this presentation. So let me now turn to the investment themes for the sector. Why are we so excited about investing in biotech? Well, really the engine of value creation in the biotechnology sector is innovation. And fortunately we are uh, at a state right now where we think innovation is the best that it's ever been. And that's really reflected uh, in this graph here, which shows the number of late stage pipeline products by therapeutic area from 2014 to 2019. And you can see that there's been an approximate 50% rise in the number of late stage pipeline products in development. And this is really occurring across all therapeutic areas. And one of the reasons why we're seeing such a surge in drug development for the industry is the fact that over the past five or six years, we have seen now the advent of a number of novel drug development technologies that are really resulting in some groundbreaking products. We've listed a number of those technologies along the perimeter of this slide here. Uh, and in each box, we've actually shown a sampling of the companies that are working with that particular technology. So those technologies include cell therapy, gene therapy and editing, nucleic acid therapies, multivalent antibodies and cell engagers, 
and therapeutic vaccines. These are vaccines designed to treat patients who already have a disease rather than prevent the disease from happening. So uh, the takeaway from this slide really though, is the fact that in the middle of the slide, you can see that so far, only a handful of marketed products are available based upon each of these novel technologies. So we would argue that we are still in the very early stages of realizing the full potential from these innovative technologies. And in clinical trials right now, there are hundreds of other drug development candidates working their way through clinical trials and dozens of them we expect to be approved over the next several years based upon these new technologies. Now, not only are these new technologies really delivering some groundbreaking treatments, delivering significant clinical benefit for patients, we would argue that they also unlock significant revenue potential for the com companies involved. So here is a slide showing a number of recent biotech driven drug approvals uh, that have occurred. And in each box, we have actually shown the peak sales estimate from the broker community with regards to what they think the drug can achieve in peak sales. And you will note that every single drug on this slide uh, the sell side believes can achieve peak sales in excess of a billion dollars. That's the threshold that most people use to consider a drug, a blockbuster drug. So effectively, all of these are expected to be blockbuster drugs. You can see that they uh, are developed for a variety of different indications, and many of them are based upon the new technologies that I outlined uh, in the slide before. So Great technology is great, innovation is spectacular, but we also have to be cognizant of the regulatory environment. Are drugs that are being filed with the FDA getting approved in a timely manner? Well, again, here we have great news. We actually have had over the past few years an FDA regulatory climate that has been very, very constructive and favorable for the industry. In fact, President Trump during his administration really supported a number of FDA policies to expedite drug approvals really as a means of increasing competition to manage drug pricing. The idea was that as long as one approved many, many drugs, those drugs would then fight it out in the marketplace and that would help moderate drug price inflation. So Scott Gottlieb, the first FDA commissioner under Trump actually uh, advocated more frequent and earlier engagement between the agency and companies to streamline drug development. The FDA engaged uh, and adopted more flexible efficacy and safety standards for FDA approvals. They increased the use of biomarkers and surrogate endpoints. And all of these policies basically led to a lowering of the time and cost to develop new drugs. Now, right now we have, as the acting FDA commissioner under President Biden, Janet Woodcock. Uh, she's not the permanent FDA commissioner yet. She's a senior FDA official with about 35 years of agency experience and she would like to become the permanent head and has support from the industry. The other leading candidate for FDA commissioner is a woman by the name of Michelle McMurray Heath. She happens to be the president of the bio trade organization. This is actually the lobbying organization for the biotechnology industry. It's unclear when Biden will make a formal permanent appointment to the FDA for the commissioner spot. But we think if these are the two leading candidates that whoever gets selected, the new head is likely going to be an industry friendly individual. Next, uh, it is true that year to date, there have been a number of unexpected drug rejections and regulatory delays that have caused some concern among investors. We do not believe this reflects a new risk averse stance at the FDA. We think that the FDA is simply swamped with the volume of investigational new drug applications that they're considering. They're obviously very, very busy dealing with the COVID crisis. And some of the drugs that uh, are expected to get approved simply have been delayed because the FDA officials have not been able to conduct their uh, customary manufacturing facility inspections due to COVID-related travel restrictions. We think all of that is going to abate over time. And in fact, earlier this month, the FDA approved the first new drug for Alzheimer's disease, a drug called aducanumab in 18 years. Uh, and that drug was approved despite a very mixed data set. So we think that reflects the continued flexibility of the FDA to approve drugs for unmet medical needs. So we think the appointment of a permanent FDA commissioner and the end of COVID related delays should really allow the constructive FDA policies instituted during the Trump administration to continue to benefit the biotech industry. 
So how does this all translate to actual numbers? Well, the great innovation paired with the constructed regulatory environment has led to a higher number of FDA drug approvals. And that's shown in this graph here, which shows the number of FDA new molecular entity approvals each year since the year 2000. And you can see that over the past four years from 2017 to 2020, during the Trump administration, when many of these policies were put into a place, we have seen a record number of new drug approvals and hopefully 2021 will be no different. Now, moving on to M&A, M&A has historically been a strong driver of investment returns in the biotech industry. Most emerging biotech companies that are taking their drug through clinical trials and eventually get it approved do not stay independent on the way to profitability. They're usually taken out by a larger player. We were initially concerned during the COVID pandemic that FDA, uh, that M&A activity would slow down. Um, but fortunately, that really hasn't seemed to have happened. So Encouragingly, despite work from home conditions, M&A and a lot of the customary business development one expects from the industry, including licensing and partnership deals, have continued unabated throughout the COVID pandemic. And so at the bottom of this slide, we have listed a number of selected biotech acquisitions. The Biotech Growth Trust actually benefited directly from a number of these. We held the target uh, uh, Alexian Pharmaceuticals in its uh, acquisition by AstraZeneca. We held Pandion Therapeutics, which was acquired by Merck, and we also held Immunomedics, which was acquired by Gilead Sciences. Moving on to the financing environment, uh, those of you familiar with the biotech industry may know that most biotech companies uh, are loss making. They don't earn any profit or even revenue for that matter. And as they're taking their first drug through clinical trials, uh, they need to tap the financial markets on a regular basis to fund those trials. Uh, now, fortunately, the financing environment for biotech has been very strong, and that's really reflected in the strong biotech IPO market we have had over the past few years. So this histogram shows the number of biotech IPOs by quarter since the beginning of 2011. And you'll note that there's been a, quite a surge of activity in the past 12 to 18 months. We estimate that since the beginning of 2018, about 200 new biotech companies have gone public. We estimate that the investable universe in biotech worldwide is now over 1,500 companies, so a wide selection of companies that we can choose from to populate our portfolio. And the Biotech Growth Trust has been actively participating in many of those IPOs, uh, as well as what they call what they call selective crossover transactions. These are transactions in the last private round prior to an IPO, uh, and many of the companies that are undertaking an IPO are the ones that have the most cutting edge technologies. And that's why the Biotech Growth Trust is participating quite actively in the IPO market. We always want to be investing in the most innovative technologies in the space. Moving on to the biotech opportunities in China. Uh, basically, most of the innovation in biotech historically has really occurred in the US and Europe. China though, is actually the second largest pharmaceutical market in the world. And we are now seeing quite a bit of innovation occurring in China. That is partly because the Chinese government really made a commitment to build a biotech ecosystem in China in 2015 as part of their 10-year plan, their Made in China 2025 plan. And as a result of those policies, the Chinese FDA actually accelerated its review times, introduced initiatives to expedite approval of innovative drugs. The Hong Kong Stock Exchange, as well as the A-Share Star Board, both changed the listing requirements for companies to go public, now allowing pre-revenue biotech companies to undertake IPOs on those exchanges. And lastly, a lot of the multinational drug industry players, the Mercs, the Pfizer's, the Glaxo's of the world are really increasingly focused on China as a promising growth market for their products. So they're bringing expertise to the country and investing in drug development infrastructure there. But perhaps the most telling sign that innovation has really come of age in China is the fact that we now have multiple examples of Western biopharmaceutical companies in licensing innovative assets out of Chinese biotech. And we've listed a number of those deals at the bottom of the slide. There are many more deals uh, that have occurred uh, over the past couple of years, and we expect an acceleration of this trend going forward. This is one of the differentiating factors that we think the Biotech Growth Trust has versus some of the other healthcare funds out there. The fact that we do have a local research team based in Shanghai and Hong Kong, 
who can do proper diligence on these types of opportunities and really catch a lot of these interesting Chinese biotechs at a very early stage. Next, uh, I'm frequently asked by investors, well, th these are all sound like great investment themes. What are the risks to the sector? The perennial risk to the biotech sector has really been drug pricing legislation, potential drug pricing legislation in the United States. The United States uh, is a key market for all drugs simply because the highest prices for drugs occur uh, in the United States. Well, fortunately, here again, we have some good news. Uh, with the election in November, uh, the Democrats actually swept the election. They took the presidency, of course, as well as both houses of Congress. But if you look at the majorities that they were able to secure, they were actually very, very slight. The Democrats already had a majority in the House. That majority was reduced significantly in this past election. So now if they want to pass legislation along party lines, they cannot afford to lose more than three or four votes. In the Senate, the majority is as thin as possible. We have 50 Democrats and 50 Republicans with Vice President Kamala Harris acting as a tiebreaker, very, very thin majority there. And we think that because of these thin majorities in Congress, it will be virtually impossible to pass any sort of extreme or highly progressive drug pricing legislation in the United States. So now that President Biden has taken office, what do we expect from his administration? Well, first off, we don't think actually that healthcare is going to be his number one priority. He's going to be focused on infrastructure, tax reform, obviously overcoming the pandemic. COVID and the COVID response is his number one priority right now, making sure that vaccinations roll out and that the country uh, can really emerge from this pandemic in a healthy way. Um, if he focuses on healthcare, the focus will really be on Obamacare and expanding Obamacare. As you may know, uh, uh, President Biden was the former vice president under, the, uh, under President Obama, and he helped shepherd Obamacare through uh, Congress uh, to give President Obama that signature healthcare reform bill win for his administration. So he has said publicly that he's only looking to expand that Obamacare system. He's not looking to replace it with a socialized medicine system of any sort. Uh, and we think that frankly, expansion of healthcare insurance coverage in the United States can only be good for biotech. It expands the number of people who can afford those drugs. Um, so we don't expect any egregious legislation to be passed in the current administration. We do expect though, something will be done on drug pricing. Some type of legislation will be passed. We just think that's going to be very incremental and very benign ultimately for the industry. Lastly, uh, no discussion about biotech would be complete without uh, touching on COVID-19 and the impact of this pandemic on this industry as well as the world. Uh, clearly COVID has attracted a number of investors to the sector. Um, it's uh, uh, stimulated a lot of interest in the biotech industry and for good reason. Um, we believe ultimately that several effective vaccines and treatments will be developed for COVID-19. We think those vaccines and treatments will really put this pandemic to rest. Uh, over 40% of the US population has already been fully vaccinated. The vaccine rollouts ex US have been a bit more mixed. And of course, that means that new variants of COVID-19 may emerge. But fortunately, we believe that the vaccine manufacturers are already developing second generation vaccines that will really be effective against these variants, uh, including possibly introducing multivalent booster shots uh, to really protect uh, the population at large. So ultimately we think continued vaccine rollouts uh, are really going to put this pandemic uh, to an end. Uh, now, what has the impact on biotech been from COVID-19? It's been very manageable. For the most part, the sales impact has been minimal. Uh, many of the prescription drugs, uh, as you know, can be taken at home and you don't need to visit a doctor to get a refill. Um, new clinical trial initiations were temporarily delayed due to COVID-19, uh, but many of the trials that had been paused have now uh, resumed enrollment. And I would also add that even if COVID-19 fades as a, a phenomenon, which we hope it does, um, the bulk of the value creation in biotech is actually being driven by innovation outside of COVID. Um, and so uh, lastly, on the positive side, I think that the biopharmaceuticals industry's work on vaccines uh, has led actually to an improvement in the public's view on the industry. And that we think is going to reduce the risk to the industry of any sort of 
uh, egregious drug pricing legislation passed uh, by the US government. Now, because uh, everyone is now poised for a reopening of the economy uh, in the United States in particular, there has been what they call a reopening trade where investors are essentially rotating out of growth stocks into value stocks into more economically sensitive sectors that are going to do better on a rebound of the economy. Uh, and so the biotech sector has been hurt temporarily, transiently, uh, due to that rotational impact. We think, again, that it's a temporary phenomenon. And ultimately, over the long term, the biotech sector should perform uh, very well based upon the innovation that's taking place in the sector, which remains very, very strong. So we think biotech should continue to perform as COVID is brought under control and should actually outperform in the unlikely event that we're wrong and COVID actually resurges, just as the industry outperformed in 2020. So moving on to the specifics about the trust and the performance. So here's a graph showing the biotech growth trust performance since inception in May of 2005. You can see we've delivered very, very strong returns over this time period, well in excess of both the benchmark index, the NASDAQ biotech index, as well as the FTSE all share index. If you look at just our past fiscal year ending March 31st, and I would encourage all of you to consult our annual report, which was just released, you can see that over this time span, we had especially strong performance. The biotech growth trust share price was up 75% in the 12 months ending March 31st. The NAB was up 55% and both were well ahead of the NASDAQ biotech index performance of being up 25%. So very, very strong performance recently. And if you look uh, in a tabular way at long-term uh, performance of this particular fund, you can see that over all the relevant time periods, three years, five years, 10 years since inception, we have uh, succeeded in generating uh, positive outperformance versus the NASDAQ Biotech Index, our benchmark index. You can see that for the fis current fiscal year since March 31st, we are lagging uh, the index somewhat. Um, that's largely due to the fact that we have more exposure to small cap stocks in our fund and that uh, growth to value rotation has especially hurt the small cap uh, segment of the industry, but we think that's going to be temporary and hopefully we can turn things around uh, during the rest of this calendar year. Moving on to portfolio strategy, really the objective of this fund is to invest in the best biotech investment opportunities worldwide based upon our firm's fundamental research. And so the key elements of that strategy are number one, we emphasize emerging biotech over large cap biotech because over 75% of the innovation going on in biotech is occurring in the emerging biotech space. So emerging biotech, these are the companies that are not yet profitable, maybe taking their first drugs or clinical trials. That segment represents 70 to 80% of the portfolio. We think the opportunity set in emerging biotech has increased markedly since uh, this robust biotech IPO market we've enjoyed over the past three to five years. And that's why we are very actively participating in IPOs to access those latest technologies. Uh, secondly, uh, we are being very active in what's called the crossover segment. So the investment guidelines of the fund permit up to 10% of the portfolio to be invested in unquoted investments. And so we have been active in making what they call crossover investments. Again, this is the last private round prior to an IPO, where the IPO is generally expected within six to 12 months. We are not doing early stage venture capital here, really just confining our private investing to the crossover stage. And I would add that Orbamed's significant venture capital business does provide excellent deal flow in this area. Third, we have a growing allocation to emerging markets, particularly China. Chinese companies now account for about 15% of the NAV of the portfolio. We are going to continue to be selective and opportunistic. And again, I think we, have, or we think Orbamed has a very clear advantage here because we have local research staff in our Hong Kong and Shanghai offices. And lastly, um, in terms of strategy, we do employ mild gearing in this fund of roughly five to 10% of NAV. We think that over the long term, that will also enhance performance. So here on page 21 is just a snapshot of the portfolio as of May 31st, 2021. You can see that geographically about 84% of the NAV is invested in the United States. And that's simply because the bulk of the innovation in biotech is still occurring in the US but we do have selected investments in Europe, as well as uh, the investments, as I mentioned, in China that roughly account for about 15, 16% of the portfolio. Uh, you'll note that at the end of May, our cash figures stood at negative 7%, meaning that we were geared by 7%. And again, that gearing is going to float between five and 10% uh, over time. 
Lastly, just to summarize what our 2021 outlook is, uh, we hope to continue the strong performance of the fund. We're basically going to be employing the same strategy we used in 2020. We think the COVID-19 pandemic should gradually abate. Innovation remains very strong in the sector. We're still at the very early stages of realizing the full potential of a lot of the transformative technologies like gene therapy, cell therapy, RNA-based therapies. So a lot of runway to go in terms of value creation for the sector. The regulatory environment, we expect to remain constructive. m and should continue. And lastly, the political environment, we think, uh, has improved quite considerably, actually, for the industry since the November election. So overall, we're very bullish on biotech. I think it's a great place to invest and hope to continue the strong returns going into the future. So with that, I'm going to turn it over now to the Q&A session. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Jeff, for the presentation. Uh, very interesting. Uh, move to questions now. Uh, the first question is on Alzheimer's and the recent approval. Uh, what is what is your view? So I'm, I think from a regulatory perspective, and I mentioned this in the in the presentation, I think it's uh, it's very um, positive for the space. Actually, this was a compound that uh, obviously addressed a huge unmet medical need, um, but had a very mixed data set where they essentially had. Uh, one trial that was positive and one trial that was negative among the pivotal trials. And yet uh, the FDA uh, thought there was enough promise in the compound to actually go ahead and approve it. And interestingly enough, they approved it with a very, very broad label. So it's approved for uh, anyone with Alzheimer's, even though the trials actually uh, only uh, focused on a subset of patients in the Alzheimer's space, the milder patients with what's called uh, amyloid, uh, evidence of amyloid in the brain. So uh, I think from a regulatory perspective, it, uh, uh, it shows that the FDA remains flexible uh, uh, and constructive in terms of getting new drugs to the market for unmet medical needs. Uh, in terms of the commercial potential, um, you know, estimates range from 10 to $15 billion for, for, for this drug. It, uh, uh, there are about 6 million uh, patients with Alzheimer's in the United States alone. So it's a huge market uh, and we don't have very good treatments for it. So. Our expectation is that um, many patients with Alzheimer's, um, perhaps uh, encouraged by their caregivers or their children, uh, are going to want to get on this drug. And our initial checks with Alzheimer's experts and clinicians is that they have been swamped uh, uh, by emails and phone calls and, and, and so forth from, from patients wanting to, to get onto the drug. I think Initially, a lot of the logistics have to be worked out. This is a drug that's delivered by a monthly infusion. Uh, reimbursement still has to be worked out as, as well, and that will take a few months. So I would not expect revenues this year uh, to be that significant, but uh, 2022 is, is, is really um, where we expect the, most of the launch ramp to happen. Um, and we think it could be a, a, a sizable uh, drug. Um, whether it's a $10 billion drug or a $15 billion drug, we'll have to wait and see. Um, I think um, uh, that's yet to be determined. And that, of course, will depend upon the reimbursement and uh, how much of a barrier some of those, those logistics may be to uptake. No, that's great. Thank you. Uh, building on that last question, what therapeutic areas are you particularly excited by at this stage? So some of you may have noticed in the uh, pipeline slide in the in the presentation that oncology is actually um, sort of the largest therapeutic area for biotech drug development. And I think that remains um, the area where there is both a significant unmet medical need as well as a lot of innovation going on. So multiple type of approaches, immunotherapy, cell therapy, targeted therapy, um, that's going on in cancer. And we've seen a lot of promising data thus far from uh, candidates in clinical trials uh, in oncology in particular. No, thanks, Jeff. Uh, is the Biden administration a, a major threat to the sector? I know you, you briefly touched on this in the presentation, but if you could just reinforce the point. Yeah, so we, we, we think a lot of the political risks have abated for the sector. Um, uh, initially, some people were concerned because President Biden uh, did talk about uh, drug pricing uh, soon after he started his term. But interestingly enough, there was no there were no drug pricing uh, 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 legislation in his initial proposals uh, for legislation. For example, for his infrastructure bill, a lot of people were expecting some drug pricing points uh, in that particular bill, and Biden chose not to include them. And I think it's because he knows that it's going to be very, very difficult with the vapor-thin majorities that the Democrats have in Congress to get anything 
passed substantially uh, on drug pricing. Again, our current expectation is that something incremental and relatively benign will get passed. Um, and I think actually the industry would welcome that because they're tired of having this drug pricing legislation overhang over the sector. Um, they would rather have Congress do something, uh, perhaps reduce out-of-pocket costs for, for individuals purchasing drugs um, that would have full support of the industry. Uh, but basically they would like Congress to get something done so that this overhang disappears and um, uh, the industry won't have to uh, contend with it anymore. So we'll see, um, but um, I don't think it's the highest priority for the Biden administration right now. No, thank you. How would you say bio is different to, to its peers? Yeah, so I think um, I think we really differentiate ourselves with our, our, our true global platform. Um, for example, our exposure to Chinese biotech, this is something that I don't think uh, any of the other funds out there really can offer. Uh, and again, we have local research analysts based out of our Shanghai and Hong Kong offices who can do the proper diligence on a lot of those names. Uh, I think we have great deal flow in the crossover space. So these are um, uh, companies uh, executing a pre-IPO round, the last private round prior to the IPO. Uh, and because of our longstanding venture capital business, we get um, excellent deal flow in that, in that crossover uh, uh, area. Um, and I think just generally speaking, you know, we have a lot of experience investing in healthcare. We have over a 25 year track record, uh, investing in healthcare, solely dedicated to healthcare. We do nothing else. Uh, and we have really a large experienced, uh, a group of talented biotech analysts that help us pick the right stocks for the portfolio. Uh, thanks, Jeff. I think the emphasis on emerging biotech is, is also a, a major uh, differentiator as well. Um, are deteriorating relations uh, between the U.S. and China likely to impact on the various uh, investee companies' prospects over time? So we, we, I sometimes get that question. Um, clearly, um, things have become a bit frosty between the U.S. and China and may continue to be frosty uh, going forward. But it's important to note that the Chinese biotech companies that we are invested in uh, are primarily serving the Chinese market. Um, so they will not be... Uh, really exposed to any deterioration in U.S.-China relations from here on out. No, great. Uh, another question from the from the audience here: Are you looking at biotech outside of medicine, materials, for example? So we tend to focus just on biotech that's focused on human health. Um, you know, on some occasions we might deviate into pet health, but it's generally all healthcare focused. So we wouldn't do any sort of um, uh, you know, true biomaterials work where it's being used for industrial uses. No, that's great. And then finally, Jeff, I think we've got time for one more. Uh, how have you dealt uh, with the COVID crisis uh, and the opportunities that's thrown up and generated? Yeah, so I think when, when COVID first emerged, I think it did attract a lot of investor interest in, in biotech as a sector. Uh, and certainly the companies that were developing COVID-related therapies or vaccines uh, saw a, a nice stock uplift uh, uh, as those programs proceeded and, and those attracted a lot of investor interest. Um, I would say we didn't actively chase a lot of those names because we felt that a lot of them had um, uh, valuations that were unjustified. Um, uh, and I think we still believe that's the case. Having said that, uh, there were a number of portfolio companies in the fund that where our investment original investment thesis had nothing to do with COVID and it just so happened that they did introduce a COVID program that helped uh, lift their share prices. So we did have, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, somewhat of a bystander positive effect uh, 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 from COVID uh, uh, in those positions. Um, I will note that in China, we do have two sort of COVID vaccine uh, investments. Those are private investments right now um, because the view here is that the Chinese domestic vaccines are not as efficacious as the ones you see in the West, and they would like to uh, obviously have their own homegrown COVID vaccines with higher efficacy. So one of the players, for example, is an mRNA player. Um, uh, and uh, uh, China, I think, is very, very uh, uh, eager to be able to develop their own homegrown mRNA-based vaccine that can hopefully deliver 95% efficacy against the virus. So we do have some selected plays in, in COVID, but I would not say that's an emphasis of the portfolio right now. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm gonna manage to generate a few more questions. Is there equal scope for M&A from the Chinese stock holdings 
or is that less likely than the U.S. equivalents? Uh, M&A does occur in China, but I think it is less prevalent. I think that's fair to say, um, but it does happen. Um, I think more in business development wise, it's more uh, licensing deals and partnerships deals that you're likely to see in China. Okay. And then finally, uh, from a valuation standpoint, is there still a major opportunity in, in the sector, uh, maybe versus the S&P at large? Sure. So just to uh, put it into context, if you just look broadly at healthcare right now, healthcare as a sector right now is trading at a 23% discount to the S&P. So major discount to the S&P. That's roughly the same discount that we found when President Obama was first uh, talking about Obamacare. So we think um, um, the, the sector as a whole, healthcare as a, as a whole, is, is trading at a significant discount. Uh, if you look at just mutual fund positioning in the United States, uh, again, here, healthcare exposures overall are close to 10-year lows, okay? Um, and that's in large part uh, due to this um, uh, growth to value shift where people are obviously positioning for an economic rebound and, 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 and overweighting more economically sensitive areas. So um, I think we have seen a, a, a pullback here temporarily in, in emerging biotech in particular. Um, when we look at the extent of the drawdown, we think that um, uh, it's largely played out uh, and we think we should hopefully see a nice rebound from here. So um, we're pretty positive about um, uh, the outlook from current levels uh, for the biotech sector. Well, thanks, Jeff. That's been very interesting. Um, appreciate your time. Uh, now we're going to close the uh, close the seminar down. Um, thank you again to everyone for, for joining the final part of the Frostro Investment Seminar Series. Uh, should you have any further questions uh, on any of the strategies we covered today, then please email us at distribution at frostro.com. Thank you again for your time.